Well, as we go back for a moment and, and look at where we have been, in, in verse 20, uh, Peter makes this statement about Christ. It says, He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. And he said, through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. Um, it's interesting because the idea of Christ being the chosen doesn't imply that he is chosen as you and I are chosen, uh, but rather that he was purposed by the Father. He was commissioned by the Word of God, became a man, was chosen to become a man by the Father in order to enter into the created world. So that before the world was ever created, Jesus Christ was crucified. In other words, in the mind of the Father. The plan of God was not something that started and then had to be repaired because Adam and Eve sinned. But before they ever sinned, God had already made preparation for the redemption of mankind. That he knew would follow into sin and become condemned as a consequence. And so what we have to understand is that when we believe in the Lord, we are entering into his plan. I like it sometimes like uh, when people talk about, are we predestined? I said, well, look at it this way. If you get on a ship that's sailing from New York to, to Liverpool, um, you basically make the choice to get on the ship. And that ship is already has a predestined course. It's going to start from point A and going to point B. How you behave on that ship depends all on you. You can be a lawbreaker, you can do all sorts of things, but you're going to end up coming to the end of that destination. And so, in a sense, every one of us are predestined because there is a day and time in which our life on this planet will end. But how we behave in that journey, how we respond to the chosen one who was sent to die on the cross for us is really up to us. And what he goes on to say is that we know him, not because we discovered him, we figured him out. He revealed himself to us. It's interesting that this word revealed, where we get our word apocalypse, the idea of something being unveiled, that the unveiling of Christ was something that Father had planned from the very beginning. And he chose this perfect moment in time in which to do it. That's why Jesus say all the law and the prophets prophesied until John the Baptist, because John the Baptist was sent as the Elijah to declare the coming of the Messiah <coughs> and the fulfillment of everything that was ordained within the Mosaic law. In other words, I had the question come up to me recently um, that why is it that um, the church doesn't keep the seven feasts of Israel? And the answer is real simple, really. First of all, <clears throat> you can't keep the feasts feast without a temple. I mean, the idea of keeping the feast, people may pretend to keep the feast, as most of the Jewish community does today, but the feast involved a temple, an altar, sacrifices, and all sorts of rituals. It, re it required a ordained priesthood. None of that exists anymore. And so people were saying, well, celebrating the Passover, well, it's a commemorative and a remembrance, but they're really pretending because they can't keep the Passover according to the Mosaic law. Why not? Well, because Christ fulfilled the Mosaic Law, He was the Passover. That everything was pointing forward to Him becoming the Passover Lamb that takes away the sins of the world. And when some people imply the idea that we Christians should still be keeping those rituals, well, we have no historical evidence that the church ever did that. The Jewish church did until the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, but the church never after that ever kept any of the festivals because they can't keep them literally. They can't go up to Jerusalem. They can't offer sacrifices. They can't do what the law required. And so the whole point was that Christ came into the world to fulfill the plant promise, which basically that's why he said, I, my blood of the, of the communion, he says, is this marks a new covenant, a new beginning in man's relationship with God, as opposed to the old covenant, which has been fulfilled. So it's not annulled in the sense that it has no value. But it's not something that we're living to fulfill. It's been fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. We've entered into his finished work. And so, as a consequence, we find that as, as followers of Jesus Christ, our eyes have been opened, and the very fact that men can see Christ as their Savior indicates that they've come into the last times. Now, last times here is not necessarily the same as the last days, or the end times, last times means this church age which will end at the end of the tribulation.
So we're living in this age right now where Christ is being revealed through his church, through the preaching of the gospel, through the ministry that you and I have. But basically, we come to this understanding because God has opened our eyes to see what otherwise we could not. And that's why he goes on in verse 21, says, Through him you believed in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. So that everything really comes down to the fact that my belief and my confidence and my faith and my submission to him is a result of what he is doing inside of me. It's not just simply me figuring these things out. It's kind of why I, I, I kind of wince when people say, well, when I accepted the Lord, and I think to myself, accepting the Lord just seems like the wrong terminology. That basically God saw something in me that he knew I would respond to him. And so he worked in my life to bring me to that moment and I surrendered my life to the Lord at that moment. I acknowledged for the first time, I see who you are, and I surrender myself to your Lordship. And maybe that's where the term accepted fits in. I accept him as my Lord and Savior, but yet at the same time, it was he who was working in me from the very beginning and drawing me by his Holy Spirit. Now, I've often shared about my own conversion, how that my wife had started praying for me before I was, we'd even started dating. Um, and uh, it was kind of amazing. God put it in our heart to pray for my salvation. And I, I can't help but think that that was the critical thing because that's when things began to happen in my life in a very profound way. I also pretty long suspect that my grandmother had, had prayed for my salvation as well because I know she gave me my first Bible and was very concerned for me. But it's those prayers that were offered on my behalf that really became the, the thing that motivated and moved me and began to affect me in a way that made me open to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because before that moment, I was completely closed. And that's why I always encourage people, if you have friends and family members, and I know we all do, who don't know the Lord, the most important thing you can do is to start praying for them on a regular basis. My wife and I have a pretty substantial list of people that we pray for every day. And uh, we believe that God's going to hear those prayers one day or other. But I believe that God's at work in their life, even though I don't see it. And I don't, you know, and I don't see them necessarily turning to Christ right away. But he is drawing them by their Holy Spirit, by his Holy Spirit. And it's our obligation I think to pray for them and to entreat on their behalf and intercede on their behalf that they can come to that epiphanal moment where the eyes are open, the veil is removed, and they see the person of Jesus Christ for who he really is and come to his saving grace. Because this is the kind of thing that's happening in some of the craziest places in the world. I've been, I know from one ministry that I'm a, a familiar with who works in Iran, that they talk about how there are people in Iran who are Muslims who have Jesus appearing to them and, and, and bringing them to Christ just by divine revelation uh, because there's nobody there to preach to them or able to preach to them. And this is pretty profound stuff, and yet it really is essentially the same thing that happened when you came to Christ. It wasn't like you discovered him and, and you came to this moment of realization. You, the eyes were open, as, as John Newton put in his famous Amazing Grace song. He said, I was lost, I was found, I was blind, but now I see. I was dead, but now I'm alive. So when you talk about somebody being lost, blind, and dead, there's not much chance that they're going to find their way to God or even their way out of a paper bag. But God opens our eyes and he brings us, he finds us, he removes our blindness, opens our eyes, and then suddenly as we respond to him, he breathes his life into us and we become children of God. Our bodies become the tabernacle of the Holy Spirit living inside of us. And then we begin to see God's outworking through his inworking. He works in us and he begins to work through us to touch the other lives of other people. And one of the most powerful things we can do, Christians, is to pray for other people to have that same experience. There's nothing that bothers the enemy more than a saint praying and asking God to reach another person for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I think the demons are terrified of that, and that's why they spend so much effort trying to convince you it's not worthwhile. I believe that those prayers, once they are prayed, they have an eternal power to them, and they will continue to work until the day in which that person is saved and is home safe with the Lord. Well, 
end of the week, I pray that God will use these things to encourage you and, and look forward to uh, having these conversations next week. God bless you and go in His wonderful grace.